from fighting with your spouse. When you're fighting with your husband or wife, you don't realise that the argument is about an illusion. But in Zazen, you recognise illusion as illusion. This is why it is important to look at life with the eyes of Zazen. Equal rights are only an issue when a couple fights. When men and women are getting on well with one another, no one talks about equal rights. Whatever you're thinking, the thoughts that come into your head right now won't be there in a thousand years. The question isn't who's right, you're simply seeing things from different points of view. No one built this wheel of suffering for you, but you are the one who spins it and you're the one who rides it. You don't realise this because you're caught in the framework of your own personal ideas. The actions of one and the same person can save a life and can provoke anger. It's the same sun that sets on New Year's Eve and that rises on New Year's Day. When you open your eyes and recognise the Dharma body, you see that no single thing really exists. Even a good-for-nothing recognises that all things are one when he wakes up to his good-for-nothing nature. Stop trying to be something special and just be what you are. Hold fire. Just sit. It all begins when we say I. Everything that follows is illusion. Everyone imagines that their ego is something unchangeable, some immovable centre point which everything revolves around. There once was a man who said, Look everyone, oh sorry, look, everyone is dying except me. He's been dead for a long time now. Following the law of casualty, ignorance suddenly rears its ugly head. Blindness means that we don't understand the way things are. If we don't understand things, the best thing would be to stay calm. But no, instead of this, we stomp around like a bull in a china shop. That's what makes everything complicated. I was just thinking that things were going better for me when I fell into a depression again. Oh, my mind is really sick. The question is only, what can you do now with this mind of yours? Life is one big contradiction. Have you seen what he's done, when all the while you would have loved to have done it yourself? Life isn't so easy. Sometimes there's war and the sky is on fire. Sometimes you take an afternoon nap by the stove. Sometimes you work the whole night through. Sometimes you get drunk with friends. In the Buddha Dharma, it is a question of how you can give direction to this life according to the Buddha's teachings. You're in love with each other, but not for your whole life. There was a couple who loved each other so much that they attempted suicide together in order to be united in death. One of the two survived and shortly afterwards fell in love all over again. Humans are truly pitiful. Beauty is no guarantee for a happy life. One woman is so adored by men that she's already had three children who don't know who their fathers are. Everybody talks about marrying for love, but isn't it really just marrying for sex? In the end, isn't it really only about a penis and a vagina? Why doesn't anybody simply say that he's fallen in love with a vagina? <laughs> <laughs> Take a look sometime at the face of a dog who's just had sex. He just stares into space with strangely empty eyes. It's exactly the same with people. In the beginning they work themselves up into a frenzy, and in the end there's nothing at all. A man who understands nothing marries a woman who understands nothing, and everyone says, congratulations, now that's something I cannot understand. Family is the place where parents and children, husband and wife, simultaneously all get on each other's nerves. When a child is defiant, the parents curse, you don't understand anything, but what are the parents like? Isn't it also true that they don't understand anything either? Everyone is lost in ignorance. Everyone is talking about education, but what are we being educated to be? Ordinary citizens, that's all. The bull is proud of his nose ring, and with the pack saddle of desire strapped to his back, he lets himself be led around by the nose and moves too. What's strange is that people are happy to put up with the same thing. People who can't still stay still in the face of pleasure, anger, sorrow and satisfaction are like mutts who can't keep from yapping. When the waves of pleasure, anger, sorrow and satisfaction have quieted down, there's nothing really left to do. Wherever you look, you see how all living beings haggle over the same goods. 
Even funnier than watching the monkeys at the zoo is observing these humans on the loose. Okay, so with this chapter and the way it's edited, I've kind of picked up on two kind of main themes. <clears throat> um, the first is about arguments and how we fail to see um, beyond our limited point of view. And then the next theme is uh, questioning what love really is. Is it just about sex? Um, so in the beginning, <clears throat> I want to talk about um, arguments. So the first two quotes kind of, yeah, uh, go straight into this. So when you're fighting with your husband or wife, you don't realise that the argument is about an illusion. Um, and then there's this second one, equal rights are only an issue when a couple fights, when men and women are getting on well with one another. No one talks about equal rights. I think um, with the second one, maybe the uh, Me Too movement would probably villainise Koda Sawaki for this kind of thing. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of people actually think that arguments are kind of good for a relationship because, you know, you're both kind of working together to try and, you know, establish, oh, this is what I need and this is how I feel and the other person does the same. Um, but I think if you're ever kind of spend time around a couple who are arguing, I mean, probably the best example would be your parents. It kind of gives you this very like uncomfortable feeling. Uh, you're not really thinking in your mind, uh, oh, then, you know, this is an ideal couple. They're getting along so well and oh, they're a role model couple. They're, you know, strangling each other and, you know, this is great. Um, so yeah, I think like from the Buddhist perspective, you know, when you see someone arguing, you just see two people clinging on to their needs. Like they're just uh, attached to their ego, they're attached to their desires, and they're just kind of fighting to get, you know, what they want from each other. Um, and, you know, from this perspective, I guess it's, you know, kind of ridiculous. Um, so, and, and Sawaki says in this um, chapter that, you know, no matter what we argue about, it's, it's all illusion. You know, if we don't understand things, the best way would be to stay calm, is what he says. But now instead of this, we stomp around like a bull in a china shop. But then, <clears throat> when, I, when I read this as well, it makes me kind of think, okay, so when you see people arguing, you're kind of like, oh, this is, you know, awful. They're, you know, why are they together? They're fighting each other all the time. But then, you know, there's the flip side of that with people who kind of avoid arguments. Like, you know, there's things that happen in a relationship, and especially if it goes on for a long time, things build up. Um, people have bad habits and you know they're not able to change them and sometimes you need the other person to actually you know point it out to you you know you can't actually see everything for yourself sometimes so yeah I think uh, you know the flip side if you're you're, you're focusing maybe too hard oh, I'm, I'm want to be this calm person I want to be someone who never causes any trouble never you know creates a wave you you're also you know avoiding your problem so Whereas on one hand, if you're like too uptight and always, you know, challenging the other person for, for what you want, um, on the flip side, you're kind of, you know, one person is clinging and the other person is avoiding their problems. So, yeah, I think while an argument might be bad, there is some sort of, you know, middle ground that could exist. Um, you know, there is perhaps an ideal argument, but I don't know, you know, it doesn't really happen very often and you don't see it so often. People are normally just at each other's throats. Um, a, an example of, you know, the, a really bad example um, is next to my um, girlfriend's house, there's this couple that they have these, I mean, it's basically like an abusive relationship. I can hear um, the, the guy, I don't know, the, I think the guy is basically, you know, he's hitting the girl and the girl many times has just run out on the street in the middle of the night screaming, ah, oh, you bastard, like, blah, blah like waking up the whole neighbourhood. Um, but the the worst thing about it is that the, guy, the girl keeps coming back. I mean, she doesn't live there, but this relationship continues. So, you know, they're stuck in this cycle. And I mean, people, you know, call this like, uh, you know, you have an abusive relationship where the abuser has some sort of control on them. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think basically, you know, these things can get really out of hand. Um, and, you know, from my own experience, when I argue with my girlfriend, uh, I'm like the, the thing I was talking about before. I'm just, you know, I don't say anything. I'm just completely silent. 
<laughs> you know, I, I, I just wanted to end as soon as possible. And, she, you know, she has some real things she needs to, to talk about. And I, <laughs> you know, I get out my phone. <laughs> you know, if, I'm really, if I'm really rude, I, I, you know, uh, it's like, uh, I, I, I don't know, you know, this is, this is not good. Like, maybe, maybe, oh, I could think, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm following Kodo's example. Stay calm, you know, just uh, stay calm. If you go on your phone, mm, yes, yes, darling, mm -hmm. But really, you know, you're, you're avoiding a situation. So, you know, perhaps an argument is, is illusion, but at the same time, you know, if you're in a relationship, you, you, you're there. It's like we were talking about the other day, you know, if you choose to be untidy, you're here. So you can't just, uh, oh, if someone's telling you, oh, why haven't you done the dishes? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. whatever. You know, you've chosen to be in the relationship. So perhaps an argument isn't ideal, but if someone's upset with you, you have to, you know, you have to take responsibility. Um, yeah, and recently I've been reading a bit more about Kodoswaki's kind of life, and when he was young, he was an, an angry young man. I mean, when you read his words, you can feel this kind of like, you know, kind of bit of like fire or fighting spirit. Like, I think, um, you know, he had a hard childhood. He, you know, his, he lost both his parents and then he was uh, put into foster care. And his foster parents were, you know, constantly having, you know, they were like drinking and I think the wife as well might have been like a, uh, a geisha as well or something like this, but they were always drinking and always fighting and they would take out, you know, all their aggression on, on Dakota. And then when he grew up, he kind of had this, you know, very like tough exterior. And I'd read that he even got into fight with uh, other monks when he was starting out. Like he was at Eheji and then this guy um, kind of like asked him to go to his temple. And he was saying, oh, if you come with me, you can be ordained. And then the guy was just like, took advantage and was, you know, drinking and had a girl around. And then Kodo Suwaki basically just was like, what the hell? And there was no like master coming. So he, he actually attacked the guy. And then there was like another example of a guy who took him to Kyushu, who the, the, the teacher there really liked Kodo Suwaki. And then the other guy who at first was kind of friends with Kodo Suwaki got really jealous because he was like his senpai. And then he was like kind of being really rough with him. And then one day he like hit him on the head or something. And then Kodosawaki like attacked him. So I think, you know, when he's talking about this idea of illusion and getting carried away with arguments, I think, you know, he's speaking from, you know, he's speaking from experience. Um, there's a quote from uh, the Homeless Kodo book. I, I'm not sure if it's in these as well. But uh, he says, imagine looking back on our lives after we die we'll see that so many things didn't matter. So I think, you know, we can get so carried away sometimes with our emotions and, and get into sort of, you know, this fighting situation um, over nothing. Uh, you know, I think this is what he means when he says, you don't realise that the argument is about an illusion. You know, it really doesn't matter so much. Uh, and perhaps you get into an argument, but, you know, you need to always have in the back of your head, you know, does this really matter? Um, and, you know, Perhaps whilst he's sort of uh, attacking these ideas, you know, is is Koda offering a solution to us here? And I think, you know, he is in his words that they might seem harsh, but there is always some sort of um, guidance in there. You know, he says, what can you do now with this mind of yours? Um, so, you know, I, th I think, you know, maybe a relationship can always go in a bad way or, you know, you can get on bad with someone and things start going in a bad direction. But it's always possible to change this. I think uh, if, if you're able to be flexible with your thinking, you can always change uh, these situations. Um, you know, I think, I think really, you know, it's important to, to take care of a relationship. You know, a relationship is something that if it's happening right now, you know, if it's right in front of you, why would you ignore it? You know, if you're here at Antigy, you take care of everything, like everything is your responsibility. So it's the same as, a, as, a, as with a relationship, you know, you shouldn't just disregard it. Um, and for me, a good example of uh, this actually was comes from um, Dochi-san from his uh, um, articles online. And he talks about this idea of um, broadening the diameter of attachment. So I'll read this quote now. <clears throat> I am indeed attached to my wife and children, but as a bodhisattva, rather than, desire, um, than denying this attachment, I try to broaden the diameter of my attachment to include more and more each time. Ideally, I wish to be attached to everything I encounter, but I don't start with telling myself to have meta-compassion for 
all suffering beings in the ten directions of the universe. I start with dealing with my children who are struggling with their toys, starving for my attention, or I start with my wife with whom I am struggling over some toy. Even funnier than watching the monkeys at the zoo is observing these humans on the loose, says Kodo. For me, this realisation is when practice begins. In the family, Bodhisattva practice cannot just be words. It is a 24-7 challenge, and more often than not, you realise that you are less of a Bodhisattva and more of a monkey. So, yeah, I think basically in a relationship, uh, it's a very good opportunity to see, you know, your shortcomings, your, you know, how deluded you really are. Um, and yeah, you should never, I think, take this for granted. I mean, maybe if you get into Zen, it might you might find it's kind of steering you away from your relationship a bit. But actually, the more you practice, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe you you start to realise that um, yeah, many good lessons can come from from a relationship. So yeah, that's me talking about the argument uh, idea. And then the next bit is this uh, quite amusing part, which is. Uh, are you in love or do you just want to have sex? Uh, for me, the most uh, striking quotes <laughs> have to be, yeah, everybody talks about marrying for love, but isn't it really just marrying for sex in the end? Isn't it really only about a penis and a vagina? Why doesn't anybody simply say that he's fallen in love with a vagina? And then the one straight after, take a look at some time at the face of a dog who's just had sex. He just stares into space with strangely empty eyes. It's exactly the same with people. In the beginning, they work themselves up into a frenzy, and in the end, there's nothing at all. I think that image of a dog, I mean, this is just, like, crazy. <laughs> it's like, he's definitely seen a dog do this, and he's really, you know, just kind of, this is stuck in his brain, that this is like, ah. Uh, you know, this kind of idea, after you had sex, like, your sort of soul just disappears and there's nothing after this. I think this is, yeah, this is a very vivid image. Um, <laughs> but I find, yeah, I find it interesting, you know, to come from the perspective of religion to talk about sex, because, you know, I think the the typical idea of religion is that, you know, you have to be this sort of angelic person and you're not bothered by uh, sexual desire. But I think, I mean, if you're being, you know, honest with yourself, like sexual desire is quite a powerful thing and you know it's something that you can't really ignore and just sort of you know tie on your iron chastity belt and just pretend that nothing's happening so i don't know using this quote of uh uh it, why doesn't anybody simply say that he's fallen in love with a vagina so i'm just gonna write vagina and then you've got these two types of people um from the religious perspective is uh you've got someone who's kind of Chasing after the vagina, just like the sort of horn devil. But then you've also got the sort of angel who's, you know, running away from the vagina. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think, uh, you know, obviously no one wants to be seen as, as this person because that's kind of like, I don't know, you're consumed by desire and you're super greedy. But then also I question this person as well, kind of running away from it. It's a bit like what I was saying with the argument thing. It's like, you know, you're kind of not facing up to the things that are just part of your life. Like perhaps, it, you know, it might, it might be uncomfortable for you. And if you create too much of a narrow sort of passage through life by, you know, practicing religion, then, yeah, you're also in a kind of tricky situation here. But I would say that, you know, from these quotes that, you know, what we're kind of looking at is this kind of, I don't know, middle, I, I can't think of an illustration for this middle person, but this sort of, you know, middle ground, you talk about the middle way or whatever, but I think there's some sort of in-between point that is maybe, you know, perhaps a bit better, you know, you're not, you're not someone who's like completely consumed by sexual desire, but then you're also, you're not sort of running away from it either. Um, <coughs> so yeah. I think um, what Kodo is doing is, in these quotes, he's asking us to just be honest about, you know, at the beginning, when we fall in love, that it is, it is mutual, you know, sexual attraction. Um, and, you know, perhaps, okay, maybe you might think differently and, you know, we have, there's so much sort of culture and, 
stuff written about love and it's meant to be this amazing thing and you know when he says oh it's just sex you're like oh god this guy's just sort of being a bit of a prude or whatever but I think it's just honesty really I, I think um, you know it doesn't necessarily need to be such a bad thing that it begins this way you know this is just the beginning um, he says you're in love with each other but not for your whole life I mean yeah I guess that's kind of brutal but for some people it's you know actually it is their whole life um, yeah, you know, I've met some sort of um, people who, yeah, have been together for like 50 years or something. And I don't know. Yeah, I think it's it's possible. But I think what he's kind of talking about here is, you know, just like not to get too carried away with this sort of beginning stage of this you know, passion and this love bit, because, you know, it can make you go maybe a bit crazy. I, I think basically, you know, the passions, uh, the, well, the sexual passion, maybe you could say people are still, you know, able to sort of, I don't know, have very, like, romantic days out and stuff. But uh, that stuff eventually diminishes. And then, you know, what are you left up with after? I mean, you, you, you fall in love very heavily at the beginning and, you know, things are all great. But then, you know, over time, oh, you can't stand the way he's sort of oh, eating his food. Oh, he's such a slob. And all this, like, you know, going back to the argument thing, all this stuff starts to sort of come about. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, the, the story that uh, Kodo refers to as well, as well, of these two lovers who attempt suicide together, um, reminds me of this uh, other story that I, I found out through this film called The Realm of the Senses, which was of this um, infamous uh, geisha. She was called Sada Abe. And in the 1930s, there was this very um, infamous incident where she basically uh, had this guy she fell in love with and she was so in love with him and they were kind of so intoxicated with their sort of sex that uh, she ended up strangling him to death and then she cut off his penis as like a memento and then wrote on the wall in his blood something about their eternal love and I think this is like I mean it's obviously a very extreme example but I think you know from experience most people can uh, are aware of you know how kind of out of hand like a passionate relationship um, can go and I guess this is why you know Kodo Suwaki says you know humans are truly pitiful because you know people get very carried away with their emotions and I think love is the number one thing or this sort of love that happens at the beginning is the number one thing that can make people go just crazy I mean you know everyone's seen you know the way people can be affected by this um, yeah, I mean, also myself, like when I was young, like when I was a young teenager, I was, you know, I'd get really obsessed with girls. Like I was just like, you know, a complete idiot. <laughs> like, and I remember on my, uh, there was the first time I kind of, the first sort of kind of thing I had with a girl was when I was on holiday. I was like 13. And it was like this Italian girl. She was from Naples and she was like, uh, I don't know, like three years older than me, like 15. She was pretty much like already like a woman. And I just, you know, just about learned how to like gel my hair and I was just still like a little boy. And she was kind of, I don't know, she was kind of like coming on to me and she was like, oh, you know, like, why don't you come and join us? And I was trying to be like, oh, so, but I was, you know, obviously like terrified. And then, I don't know, I spent some time with her and was like, you know, young and naive and didn't have a clue about women. And I just fell in love with her like as a young boy. And then, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, I had no idea how this was going to work. We were just on holiday and I don't know. And then, you know, it was kind of the relationship, I don't know, went somewhere. And then it was kind of, I, I think maybe I, I just like kissed her. And then I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, what more will come of this? And she said, oh, by the way, Edward, I've got a boyfriend. And then she showed me a picture of her boyfriend and he was kind of like a cross between like Cristiano Ronaldo and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> he was wearing some Speedos. He was kind of like, I was like, oh God, you've got a boyfriend. Like, I just couldn't believe it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. This is, I mean, I've just written here, this is not adult practice. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just, uh, I, you know, you get, I got carried away and I, I wasn't thinking practically. I was just somehow imagining that something was happening here that was, you know, really significant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I mean people who you know uh, this kind of thing of talking about people falling in love uh, you know I think uh, Kurosaki is just kind of saying you know just be aware be aware of what's happening okay maybe it's very strong emotions but you need to just be aware of 
you know, what direction you're heading in. Because, uh, you know, if people fall in love and then they get married and then, you know, they're not, they don't have this kind of sexual attraction anymore, thing, that's when things get really messy, you know, people have affairs or, you know, they, they just get bitter and then their children have to suffer as a result. Um, so, yeah, you need to, I think, you know, these things happen in the beginning, but you need to, you know, make, be aware of your responsibilities and make sure things are working. Um, I have a quote here from Uchiyama who, who says, you know, to truly love someone is very difficult. Um, so I think, you know, perhaps there's these different ideas of what love is. Many people think you fall in love at the beginning. It's this kind of idea of, you know, you're losing control, like you fall into it. But uh, sometimes, you know, it can be a very long road. And I think, uh, you know, that's really when, the, you know, the, when you get into the sort of the heart of the relationship, it's probably a bit after this sort of passionate period. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, people get married and this is why Cody says, a man who understands nothing marries a woman who understands nothing. And everyone says, congratulations, um, you know, this is, you know, when you're at a wedding, maybe, so, you know, sometimes you can be at a wedding already and just be like, oh, this is never going to work. I know, I know what this guy's like, like, I know, I know I've seen him on a night out or something like, oh, it's never going to work. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I have this, um, quote from from Shakyamuni. Um, so I, I guess, well, the majority of, uh, you know, the old, you know, the, the Buddhist teachings were addressed to home leavers, people who, you know, abstaining from sex. Um, there are, you know, some teachings that he had for householders. Uh, and he basically described marriage. Uh, there was four types of marriage. There's a wretch who lives with a wretch, a wretch lives with a goddess, a god lives with a wretch, and a god lives with a goddess. Um, speaking about the first one, how does a wretch live with a wretch? Here, householders, the husband is one who destroys life, takes what is not given, engages in sexual misconduct, speaks falsely, and indulges in wines, liquor, and intoxicants. The basis for neg negligence, he is immoral, of bad character. He dwells at home with a heart obsessed by the stain of stinginess. He abuses and reviles ascetics and Brahmins, and his wife is exactly the same in all respects. It is in such a way that a wretch lives with a wretch. So this is kind of like just a description of a really horrible marriage. Um, except, I mean, you know, people probably, I mean, would come across this except for the he abuses and reviled ascetics and Brahmins. I mean, you probably don't get that so much these days. But I think it's interesting that, you know, the opposite of this uh, situation is a god and a goddess. So for, for, for Shakyamuni, he thinks that, um, you know, people who live the opposite of this uh, kind of enjoy heaven in this world. Um, I think as well, you know, I mean, this goes back to this kind of, this person again. Uh, sometimes you can see an ideal couple, but, you know, also this ideal couple could be, you know, maybe on the surface they seem very, you know, things are all great, but... You know, this kind of idea of an angel, you know, an angelic couple, a god and a goddess. You know, I think sometimes, you know, this can also be, you know, maybe a kind of hell, hellish type situation. Um, so, yeah, I think basically from, from his own experience, Kodo is aware that if a, if a couple fails to develop, um, you know, a relationship that's based on respect, uh, you know, their home life can be hell. I mean, you know, this is something that he experienced himself. Um... For me, you know, I've never known, um, I mean, at the beginning here, he says, you know, he talks about illusion. He says, uh, yeah, when you're fighting with your husband or, or your wife, you don't realise that the argument is about illusion. But in Zazen, you recognise illusion as illusion. This is why it's important to look at, the lo at life with the eyes of Zazen. So for me, I've never known um, Zen practice without being in a relationship. It was actually my girlfriend who gave me a book about Zen. And then she was the one who suggested I started sitting. Um, but now, you know, the only thing we ever argue about is the fact that I've decided to cut, you know, be away from her and live here in Antigia and practice as Um So, yeah, I guess it's, you know, you could say that's quite an ironic situation. But, you know, at the beginning, I, I had no idea how to deal with this. Uh, you know, I continued the relationship, but I was very, you know, rigid. I was thinking... You know, I want to be a monk and whatever, you know, just I'm just going this way. And, you know, I was being really stubborn minded. Um, but, you know, after a while, I, I realized that, you know, I was kind of 
you know, neglecting something that was in my life that was right in front of me. And, you know, now in the end, I've chosen to do, um, to do both. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I still don't know how, how it's, you know, working or how it's going to work. Um, but, you know, all I can do really is take care of uh, what's in front of me. Um, you know, while it might seem that, as Kodo says, you know, I'm building and spinning my own wheel of suffering because, you know, I'm just in a kind of confusing and complicated situation that I've chosen to be in. Um, you know, I can appreciate how this situation is, you know, actually forcing me to let go of, you know, many things. And, you know, I let go of who I expect I should be. Perhaps, you know, at the beginning I was thinking I want to be a monk and this is something I have to be. But, you know, I've learned to, you know, just let go of everything. I, I think, uh, you know, really, if I'm not focusing on what's right in front of me, then, you know, I'm not really practicing properly. Um, you know, and... and with my girlfriend, I really, you know, I love my girlfriend and I, I have to, you know, this is something I should take care of. It's something that it is in front of me and, yeah, I have no problem really with facing that. Um, yeah, Kodo says, everyone imagines that their ego is something unchangeable. Blindness means that we don't understand the way things are. So for me, at the beginning, I wasn't looking at the way things are. I was, you know, being rigid. I was, my ego was uh, unchangeable. Um, but then, you know, I've also realised another thing with this, uh, you know, relationship thing and, and, and kind of the responsibility side of things. I mean, the other day we were talking about things that you want to do or should do. And sometimes, you know, with these uh, arguments I was having with my girlfriend, I was thinking, you know, sometimes I was, the way I was explaining myself was, you know, why, why we were continuing this re relationship was, you know, I was using this more of the should thing and like taking on this responsibility and saying, you know, I should, I should do it. But then she would kind of ask me, you know, what about what you want to do? And I was so focused on this kind of should thing that I didn't actually, I wasn't actually, you know, kind of expressing myself in the way of, you know, wanting. And I think, you know, with the relationship, yes, you know, perhaps the desire side of things is, you know, delusion and this kind of thing. But also, you know, it's something that you have to want to do. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, basically, as I said before, you know, a relationship uh, is very good practice and you know it doesn't even have to be with with you know your girlfriend or whatever it can just be with anyone um, I think you have to really appreciate uh, you know what's going on in front of you and um, yeah I think you know from my own experience uh, I've learned that you know th these kind of things allow you to be more flexible and they allow you to let go um, and dreams are then, you know, you can see things as they are, but then, you know, when, you, when you're not sitting, it's a lot harder. So, you know, when you're uh, in a relationship, there's constant decisions you have to make. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge, I think. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps, you know, when we form relationships, we're, we're at the beginning, we're a bit like this dog uh, that Kodo describes, you know, where we're like animals. Uh, you know, we're just... Um, being drawn together because of our desire but you know I think this is just the beginning phase I think there's you know a lot more than just that and if you spend a significant amount of time with someone then you know that's that becomes something different and yeah I don't think there's any reason that you know you can just say that you're together because of attachment and delusion I think there is something quite um, valuable there um, I don't know for some reason I've written here about animals uh, you know, that there are some animals that mate for life and there's some that eat their other half. I don't know why I wrote this. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I think basically, there is a quote here that I, I was just re realised that happened, but it's something... Uh, uh, oh, I should have written this down, but it, it's just this idea of, um, you know, whatever your situation is, you need to be aware of it. And, you know, you should you should take care. Um, okay, so that's that's all for chapter three. Um, for chapter four, uh,